Hi, everybody. Welcome to the LibertyCon panel about which is easier to write, science fiction or fantasy. My name is William Allen Webb. Uh, I want you to remember that so you can forget it and uh, not have to uh, see me in your nightmares. Um, whether you're a writer looking for insight or a reader trying to learn more about the awesomeness of our, loving our favorite genre, I think I speak for everyone here when I say that we really hope you enjoy this panel, um, that maybe you learned something, maybe it's informative, maybe it's just entertaining. Um, but most of all, we, we hope you have fun. I think we ought to just start by having everybody spend a minute or so to tell us about themselves, um, how long, how they've gotten where they are in their career, and uh, you know what they've got on the horizon. Um, we are having some technical issues with one of our panelists, and so uh, we're going to start with Teresa Howard. But um, there is a little bit of feedback here, and we can't figure out what it is. So uh, if that comes up during her conversation, just be aware that we know about it and we're doing the very best we can, but we certainly want to hear what Teresa has to say. Um, let me get you to mute yourself right now. I want to tell, we did have a little feedback, so I want to tell everybody what you said, okay? All right. So uh, for those of you who couldn't, couldn't hear it, Teresa has, and correct me if I'm wrong, Teresa, okay? Uh, 12 short stories. You've been writing since 2000. Uh, 12 short stories, two novels and currently in publication and a th another novel coming along that's under consideration this summer is that right okay good um it is going to be a little difficult so i'm going to try and um when, when you speak Teresa, i'm going to try and uh if, if it seems like it's difficult to hear just let everybody know uh what you said okay because i don't want anybody to miss anything uh amy would you like to go next sure sure my name is um Amy Herring, but I write as Louise Herring Jones, hence the double names on my little epitaph there, if you will, Tombstone. And um, I write both science fiction and fantasy. I also write some pulp, some steampunk, a little historical fantasy, and every once in a while I try literary fiction, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> um, I have had 15 stories published. Um, 14 of those have been in, in anthologies. We actually counted them up this afternoon. Six were science fiction, six were fantasy, one was steampunk, and one was pulp. <laughs> and the other story that was published online many years ago, which is no longer available, was a science fiction story. And it's kind of interesting. I, I sort of have equal success as far as contests and awards with science fiction and fantasy. It's like right down the middle. So I truly write both. I've written several novels, probably about seven or eight novels now, and they're about half and half. Um, um, the ones that are fantasy and science fiction, they're kind of right down the middle. And I also write um, mystery in uh, alternate universes, so. Fascinating, okay, great, thank you. Charity, would, would you like to go next? You're, I think sure. you're muted. Yeah, I had to find it. <laughs> I was like, where's my cursor? <laughs> um, I'm Charity Ayers. I write predominantly fantasy, um, a variety of it, dark fantasy, epic fantasy. Um, I also do a bit of a steampunk sci-fi fantasy mix with mythology. Um, I have some sci-fi uh, short stories that are published uh, based on my background in the Navy. So I, I have my communicator aspect kind of going into my characters there with a little bit of the, the military sci-fi. Um, but yeah, my, my love tends to be fantasy more than anything else, but I, I like to mix genres whenever I can. So they're action-based or mystery-based or, you know, sometimes they're a little bit of paranormal romance mixed into it as well. So it's kind of broad. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, uh, Martin Shoemaker, uh, I'm introducing him yep. that way. I'm going to let him speak, but that's because I've read his book on uh, how to be a dictator. Um, and we're not talking about taking over small countries uh, twice. So uh, I've had, I have found him to be a particularly useful author to read his nonfiction as well as his fiction. Martin. I'm, I'm very honored by that. And I, I'm glad to hear the book is helping you. Um, Martin Shoemaker, Martin L. Shoemaker on all my covers because I don't know why if it was good enough for Heinlein, I figured I had to have a middle initial too. <laughs> um, 
I primarily am known for my science fiction, leaning towards the hard science fiction. I've got three novels out, one of which people tell me is hard science fiction, and I wonder what they're smoking, um, because I know enough about artificial intelligence research to know that my Android is nothing like realistic artificial intelligence. But then I've got two novels out that are a pretty strong attempt to get the science in the ballpark um, through 47 North. There, there's a series of two books involving travel to Mars and mysteries along the way. On the other hand, the fourth novel that I've finished is now in my agent's hands is what I would best describe as rural fantasy. I can't really call it urban because the largest place they visit is a city of a whole 5,000 people. <laughs> So it's, it's out there in the boondocks. And then as soon as I finish that one, I turn right around and go back into the hard science fiction where for my next one, I'm having to calculate home and transfer orbits between the moons of Jupiter because I want to get it right. So I flip flop. I, I, I like that. Uh, you write rural urban fantasy. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's a, the village the guy's in has got like 60 people. That's pretty rural. Yeah. Um, so, and I am uh, Bill Webb. I write as William Allen Webb because there are a bunch of Bill Webbs running around. And uh, I write science fiction and uh, mostly military science fiction of various stripes. I do write fantasy. I uh, have an urban fantasy series as well. And I've been doing this for about 50 years. Um, I'm also a military historian in that uh, I do write nonfiction military history as well. Um, so we, we all seem to be a panel of people who have done a lot of things and have a lot of experience in different genres and fields. So I think the best way we can do this is uh, probably try and limit our answers to about two minutes if we can. Um, thereabouts, just so we can cover as much ground as possible. And um, the first question I think we want to answer, and this one's really coming out of left field, okay? I really had to strain to come up with this. What's easier to write, science fiction or fantasy? Um, why don't we start this time with Charity? Put you on the spot. Well, sure, why not? <laughs> um, honestly, I'm not sure I can fully answer that in one direction or another. And I hate saying that because I, I'm also a teacher and I force my kids to pick a direction. And right now I'm having a problem picking a direction. <laughs> For me specifically, I would say fantasy is easier to write because I feel like with fantasy, you have a lot more wiggle room. Mm -hmm. You can deviate from the patterns. You can deviate from, you know, historical aspects of, you know, fantasy, mythological creatures and all that. And you can kind of mix things around and, you know, play with them a little bit. Science fiction, on the other hand, if you deviate too far from what's known in like, say technology or chemical basis, um, you're really gonna upset your reader because the readers are gonna pick up on those details and they're gonna go, wait, 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 that can't do that. You can't make that happen that way. Um, sometimes you have a little bit of space in there, but there are very specific rules in science fiction that don't necessarily exist in fantasy because again, fantasy, you can deviate out, you can spread, you can mm -hmm. you know, change things around. So I guess I, I kind of, I lean towards fantasy, but I, I can see that either one of them could have possible potential pitfalls. So I didn't mean to alliterate right there, but it just kind of came out. <laughs> There's nothing, nothing wrong with alliteration. <laughs> And, and I will say this, uh, I understand on the details, if you ever really want to uh, have people pick your stuff apart, try writing World War II history. Yeah. And uh, they will tell you if you're using the wrong, if you've got the wrong type of gun in whatever unit. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I understand that. That's a good answer. Thanks, Charity. I will actually add one last thing there. Um, sure, absolutely. If in fantasy specifically, you mix it into historical fantasy, mm -hmm. then that's when you start to get some of those layering of rules again. And that mm -hmm. kind of, you know, pins it down a little bit further. So again, okay. potential pitfalls. Following up on that, one of the uh, series that I read when uh, I was younger, 
uh, and a lot of people haven't read it, but it's a great series if you like horror fantasy, um, is uh, Anno Dracula by uh, Kim Newman. And uh, there was a, uh, 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 it was set during World War One. One of the books was set during World War One, So Dracula is uh, part of the German military. Or actually, he was part of the British military. But, but you had to get all the details right. And you had to do the research to make sure that everything that you were saying was correct and all that kind of stuff. Because people like me would have picked it apart if they got it wrong. Yeah, you can do the insertion, but you still have to make it plausible, you know, for your reader to be able to follow along. Definitely. You do, you do yeah. Uh, Martin, how about you? I, I'm going to be the guy that when you ask me A or B, I answer yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's just me. Um there Go ahead. They're both easy to write. No, I was going to say, so they're both easy to write. Um, I think it's a matter of they're both as hard as you make them. Going back to what I just mentioned with the book I'm working on now, where I'm having to learn how to plot home and transfer orbits because I want it to be right, as opposed to my Android story, where I pretty much made up whatever I needed to fit the um, fit fit the plot line that I was working on. It's to a degree a matter of how hard you want to make it. Um, and you can do that same thing in fantasy. Uh, I like to call it ruthless consistency. And Larry Niven is like the master of this. Ruthless okay. consistency is define the rules of your world and never break them. And beyond that, find how those rules define your story. So Niven has a whole series of stories that would not be technically called hard science fiction, I don't think, because they involve a mechanism of teleportation that, mm -hmm. that might as well be fantasy. But he sticks by the rules and he goes and shows how the entire culture in one story after another is shaped by this new form of teleportation and how it breaks up people's sense of privacy and how cr criminals use it to create uh, new ways of escaping crimes and so on. He just thoroughly explores ruthless consistency of this concept of teleportation. And you can, in fantasy, approach it that way if you want. And so to me, if you want to make your hard fantasy that's every bit as rigorous as hard science fiction, that is an option that's out there. And if you want to do your light, fluffy science fiction that is practically just, well, I mean, let, let's face it, bad Star Trek can be pretty fluffy science, but it's still got plenty of fans. So mm -hmm. I kind of feel like it's where, where, you, where you have your natural inclination. For me, I lean towards the science fiction, but it's whichever one grabs me on the next book. Would you, for the benefit of our listeners, would you tell us what the series is, Niven series is that you were referring to? Uh, I cannot recall the particular name. Um, okay. It's the, the Permanent Floating Riot Club. The Last Days of the Permanent Floating Riot Club is one in that series. Okay. Um, and I cannot remember what the other ones are, but it's... <sighs> It's not part of his Guild the Arms series. I don't think it's part of Known Space. I think it's a separate universe. I haven't read it in probably 15 years. Okay. But it's just this sheer series of stories of what happens when people can suddenly be able to be anywhere in the world. Uh, one of the early stories that he covers is, for instance, the fact that it utterly destroys the livability of places like Tahiti. Because all of a sudden, people who would want, wish that someday they could go and see Tahiti can all be there in the next five minutes. <laughs> it gets crowded. And it gets crowded, and it's not Tahiti anymore. That's true. Okay. E excellent. So people can find it through uh, that title. That's a great title, by the way. Um, Amy, which do you find easier to write? I actually find them equally difficult. Um, I think some of it has to do, and I don't want to put judgment calls on one genre over another. It just You're is... Not. It's how exacting you want to be in whatever you're writing. And what I think that happens in, in the best science fiction and fantasy, you have intense world building. And if you want to compare, you know, use Clark's third law, if you want to compare technology and science to magic, those are both systems that you have to be um, thoroughly 
engaged with and they have to be somewhat accurate or at least consistent i think it was martin that's talked about consistency um mm -hmm. in order for them to be believable to the reader and for you to reach that suspension of disbelief that you have to have from your reader in any piece of fiction whether it's science fiction fantasy or whatever you're writing so for me part of it is i don't have beyond uh, like a high school, not excuse me, high school, college freshman knowledge of sciences, and that's limited to biology and physics. And, mm -hmm. and on with regard to magic, I've never been a practitioner, never gotten any of my spells to work. <laughs> so I'm very much a novice there as well. So for me, building either one of those requires quite a bit of effort. So I think they're both very, very mm -hmm. difficult, at least they are for me. Um, there's also a problem, and I did a talk once. Um, I live in Huntsville, Alabama, where we built uh, the a lot nice, of the space nice systems and all. Right, and and I'm a member of a local group that's part of the National Space Society. And mm -hmm. I once they asked me once to do a talk to them about write about scientists writing science fiction, and a lot of the discussion ended up centering on the fact that sure they knew the science but they didn't know the craft of writing a story so for them the challenge was not the science and getting the science right it was getting the story elements in such a way that you had a believable and an enjoyable satisfying mm -hmm. story so i think it doesn't matter where you are i mean if you're a practicing magician that can turn you know put wings on pigs or whatever or if you know if you're somebody who's a rocket scientist like my friend you have to get beyond that and you still have to tell the story and have a convincing world or universe that your story is set in so i find them both hard but i find um i love to write i write a lot of terrible first drafts Mm -hmm. And then I just work them to death, trying to get them to revise to a level that I'm satisfied with them. So, um, I, I did want to mention, by the way, that if anybody has a comment while somebody else says something when they get done, don't let me just dominate. You guys just, you know, chip in whenever you think you have something to add, okay? Um, I want to add that all first drafts are terrible, Amy. <laughs> all of them. They're all terrible. So I that comment is yeah. true no matter what. No, go ahead. I can certainly vouch for my first drafts being terrible. So, but I still love them. It doesn't matter. I still like them, but they're they need so much work before I can let them to be seen in public. I got to dress them up a little bit. So, Absolutely. the best quote, the best quote I, I I've always the quote I've always liked about first drafts is from Jane Smiley, uh, and she said, uh, first drafts only have one reason to exist, and that's to exist. They only the the only reason." for a first draft to exist is for it to exist. Because uh, Hemingway famously said they are all um, bovine manure. And uh, uh, and that's probably true, they are, but that's not their point of exit. You can't edit a blank page, so you have to have a first draft first. Uh, Teresa, which do you find easier to write? So what Teresa answered was that for her, fantasy is a lot easier. And, uh, that um, unless it's something along the lines of like space opera, where uh, the science is not the whole point of the story, it's the um, very much like uh, I, if dare boy, I'm not even going to go there because I would get killed. But uh, very much like some early TV shows from the '60s that were in science based, where the science really wasn't the point of the story; it was the stories that were the point of the story of the show. Is that fair to say, Teresa? Okay. I think we kind of already answered the, my next question that I was going to ask. So we'll go, to, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to it if we have to. But are you the type of writer and, and do you like to read? We'll throw that in there too. Who develops their world in great depth first, to, but to include, and I'm kind of assuming we all do, but do you include those details a lot of those details in the story, or is that more for your benefit? And I'll give you an example. Um, if in your work you have uh, FTL, faster than light drives, or you have magic, do you go into great detail about how the FTL works or how the magic works, or do you just have it work and don't 
deviate, but you don't really go into a whole lot of explanation of why. Um, let's start this time with Martin. We haven't started with you yet. If I can unmute here. Sure. Up, oh, you're muted. You're muted. There you go. All right. I should be unmuted now. All right. I'm, I'm going to be wishy-washy again because the answer is I kind of do both. Okay. In, in, my, in my rural fantasy that I just finished, I literally started with a premise and I invented the magic as I went along to support what was happening in the premise at the time for probably the first 30% of the book until I'd invented enough rules to have a structure I could then work with it. Okay. So in that case, I was not planning it out at all. It was simply, if this is the premise, if this is the rule that these characters are operating under, what does that tell me about the magic behind it? Of what the premise is, the premise is there's a storage unit that has something inside it. The owner of the storage unit has stopped paying for it, which means that the person who owns the lot now has to auction off the contents in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And all sorts of demons and sorcerers and such start showing up to <laughs> basically want to bid on what's in this, in this auction, in this storage unit. And suddenly I had to ask myself, they're demons and sorcerers. Why don't they just take it? Mm -hmm. And so I had a magic system that forced them to wait two weeks for the auction. And that became my entire story is the two weeks leading up to the auction event. So I had to create a magic system where that made sense. Yeah, I would make a and great we TV. Go, the other go ahead. Yeah. And then we go to the other extreme on the one I'm on now where if I don't know where the moons of Jupiter are at any given moment in my story, I don't know how long it's going to take for the next trip they're taking. And therefore, I don't know how much time the opposing forces will have to prepare for them. So on that side, I'm having to be absolutely nuts and bolts detailed. So it's story dependent. Very story dependent for me. Um, okay, let's, uh, Amy, let's go to you next. Okay, I I think basically I try to put in as much detail as the story merits. Okay. If the detail does not advance the story in some way, I generally kind of gloss over it and its background. Um, I think the way you started this, though, um, I do start with a lot of, when you first talked about, do you do a lot of worlds? You know, some people do a lot of world building when they start. I am really into the venue or the location of any story that I write. I do okay. a lot of world building that may not be written down. It might be a result of my reading about an area or mm -hmm. reading about, uh, for instance, possible colonization of Mars. I know I did that in a story recently. And I read very in extensively. And then I generally write with nothing but like a little bullet point outline. I mean, maybe five things that I want them to do X, Y, and Z. And I want it to start this way. And sometimes I know how it's going to end and sometimes I don't. But generally with details, I try to avoid data dumps. Well, Bob, this is how the faster than light <laughs> engine works. And remember... Uh, one time I talked to Gregory Benford about the fact that I couldn't I couldn't tell a rocket engine from a lawnmower engine. He said, well, you know, they're a lot bigger. He didn't say that. But <laughs> he said, just call it an engine and don't worry about it. Let them, you know, that you get there within so much time, just, just go forward. And, of course, Benford can describe, he's a scientist, and he can sure. describe rockets to the nth power. But if you read a, one of his space operas, he doesn't do that. He stays away from it. He just gets from point A to point B in so much time, and you have to infer uh, what time, what type of propulsion he's using. So I just try to follow that. Just call it an engine, and just mm -hmm. go on, and only include a lot of detail if the story, the the story needs it to advance the plot and the characterization. And if it doesn't, leave it out. Um, I think you. I think that's a really good point, and and I have a follow up question for you. Do you find a lot of um, a lot of novels by 
or, or stories, novels. Um, how often do you run across info dumps? Uh, I'm just curious, you know, about your, uh, as you're reading science fiction and fantasy, um, do you run across that a lot? Do you think? Uh, I don't run across it as much, but I, I'm really bad about reading novels that have won Hugo's or Nebula's and, you know, that have kind of already been vetted. Right. Um, I don't read a lot of, um, uh, you know, like first time novelist stuff. I do read some. And some of them are good, and some of them have dumps in them. Um, I read, I read a lot for other writers. I'm in like three or four writers groups, mm -hmm. and we're all very cognizant of not doing data dumps, but they still show up even in writers that have done very well. You'll you'll see data dumps, and I just think it's real easy to do it, especially if you've got all kind of wonderful research that you're just fascinated by <laughs> and funny thing it ends up in your story and that's the if that's the part the readers are going to skip over it's got no business being there right um and, and that's what i was I, I think i was getting at because that happens to me a lot where i'll come across a, a long stretch of two or three pages of just information and after a while you're just your brain kind of turns to mush and you say okay what i need something to happen here um, unless that's the whole point of the story. Uh, Charity, we haven't heard from you yet, have we? On uh, no, and actually I was going to kind of piggyback off of what Amy said with the, the data dumps. Mm -hmm. That is one of my pet peeves. And a lot of times you do find it. You find it, I feel like you find it more in science fiction because they feel like they have to explain the technology, why it should work. And mm -hmm. I feel like if you build it into the story appropriately, you shouldn't have to really explain that. You know, if you have to justify your reason for having that there, then I feel like you're going to lose some of your readers. Fantasy doesn't always do that, but you still get some of those where they they build too much backstory in. They, you know, they have this character dialogue where they go off for, you know, five pages talking about this childhood event that they had because they're giving you the background of the character. And yet that story never again plays into anything else that's happening. And it's like, why did you put it there? Could you not have made that a short story and just kind of floated it off somewhere else for somebody who wanted to read it? Um, it, it gets to be a bit much. And I world building, I'm kind of more like Martin on that. It builds as you go. It, it depends on the story. Sometimes you have to you know, structure a little bit. But I feel like when you're building that setting, when you're setting the scene for what your characters are doing, um, it's automatic mm -hmm. without being too explanatory. You know, you're not, you know, structuring every single little thing out. Um, the only times that I've ever done anything that's outside of the novel as far as world building goes is like the geography, if I built a land mass and I needed them to move in certain directions, then I've, I've found myself sketching it out just so that I can remember, okay, well, if I started here and they're going to here, they have to cross through this to get, you know, but that's for me more than it is anything else. Like, okay, right. this needs to be logical. This needs to be like, I can't have them, you know, run through the house and in the middle of the house, there's a bathroom that they have to make their way through to get to the living room. That's just not gonna make sense. So, you know, little things like that. Um, as a follow-up question and, and on on what you're talking about, I, I actually have a uh, young writer that I'm mentoring and um, he and he writes fantasy and he told me the other day that uh, and I asked him how his writing was coming along. He says, well, I'm still world building. And uh, I do think it's possible. Do you, have you found that a lot of young writers maybe get hung up on the world building at the expense of writing the story? Honestly, um, and th this might be a little bit controversial to say this, and because I work with young writers Ooh. too. We love um, controversy. I know, right? Um, I feel like that is part of the writer procrastination. Mm -hmm. I feel like when we start to overly focus on, oh no, I have to make the scene exactly right and I need to sketch out every single character and outline everything, it's because you're pushing away the writing, you're letting yourself get distracted from it. You know, it's the same as, oh wait, I have these emails to answer. No, just focus on what you need to focus on and put the other things away. Um, but yeah, young writers, it just depends on how they get into the story, I think. You know, for some of my students, 
the writing, like they throw themselves immediately into dialogue, which honestly I prefer because I feel like if you're getting your characters talking, you're starting to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. You're starting and you can build from that. And of course, we already know first drafts are awful. Right. Um, but when they focus so much on the setting, they start to lose character connection. They mm-hmm. start to lose connection to what the story is that's happening within that setting. So, you know, I, I think you, you really made a great point. And for those listening who might be young writers, uh, if, if nothing else comes out of this panel than what you said, I think it's worth watching the time they've spent because uh, I'd never really thought of it in that way before, but that world building can be a, a form of, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't, you said procrastination. I'm not so sure it's a lack of confidence because world building is fun and I can keep doing this and nobody's yeah. going to read it. And I can tell people about this cool world, but I'm never going to be judged on what it is I've written. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a great, great point because um, I, we all have a tendency not to want to show anybody our first drafts because we know they're not very good. And as a young writer, you probably think they're worse than they really are. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a a big part of that writing process is getting the confidence to continue the confidence to, you know, build something off of it. But I feel like uh, when somebody overly focuses on the world building, it's like, you know, the game Sims, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Some people will go in there and play, you know, Sims and spend all their time building up the house, building up. They're not playing the actual story of the game. They're more focused on just building the things around it. And then when they get everything they want, they dump it and walk away. So I feel like sometimes if you get overly focused on just the details of the setting, just the details of the world, you disconnect from the beings that are living in this world. You know, the story that's Mm -hmm. living there and waiting to come out. Amy, you unmuted. Did you have something? Yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to actually. She kind of took the words out of my mouth. I think that's a world building is a big emphasis in video games and people who want to be video game designers, and that's a rabbit hole that you can just get caught up in. But I think for people like myself, I mean, I've played like three video games in my entire life, and two of them came out in the seventies. So uh, that's that shows what I know about video games. I've been using their list though. Because they have great world building lists. If you want to like write down, kind of get an idea of what your world is like. I usually get about halfway through them and I say, that's enough. I, I got my world. I don't need to do any more. But yeah. I think that, that that's still an issue for writers. Because think about what Tolkien did. Not only did he build his, uh, his Middle Earth. He wrote a language. Oh, my God. He wrote all the mythology. He spent decades doing that. I think he spent a decade writing the books as well. So um, it's an easy trap, and it's one that I have fallen in and currently trying to claw my way out of it on one (laughs) particular project that I've been working on for a long time. But um, I do. I also write historic fantasy, and that's one that you can really get stuck in that trying to get it right. And I've, but it's also yep. a great it's a great excuse for trips to Europe. So I'm I'm all for it. I'll just get lost in those for quite some time. Nothing nothing better than a legitimate tax write off. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Teresa, we're going to get to you in just a second. Martin, uh, unmuted for this too. I haven't forgotten you. Okay. Uh, Martin. I- yeah, I just wanted to echo what what Amy said that I don't want young writers to feel like this is just them. It's it's all of us um because it is so fun. So don't feel like oh no, this is a proof that I'm young and inexperienced. It's no, we we the biggest experience we have is we know to tell ourselves no. But but yes. it's it's always there. There is one of the uh, and I'm not going to I'm certainly not going to mention any names, but there is one particular writer writing today who um, the books are, I would say, about 60 percent info dump and a uh, very successful author. Um, and and they happen to be very good at it, but they're still info dumps. And uh, it happens and, and it's proof that you can actually do it and make money doing it and sell books. But um it's not something that most people could do because if I ever tried to do that the way this person did it, it wouldn't work. So, um, Teresa, 
which uh, how how do you do it? Do you go into great detail or? So what Teresa was saying, and I think it's a really, really, really important way to write, is that rather than info dumps, let the world uh, evolve through the experiences of the characters. And if they need to know how the magic works, if it's part of the plot and the way she's telling the story, then I can go into that. Or if we need to know how the FTL drive on a spaceship works, we will go through that. But that the characters are the ones driving the story forward. And those things are only important as they relate to the characters. Did I get that right? Okay. Good. And I, and I think that's really, really, really an important point, along with uh, what everybody else has said to understand with this is, and you guys have made some great points, um, that char- stories are ultimately driven by characters. And if they're driven by plot, that may carry you for a while, but it's only going to carry you so far. And at the end of the day, if it's not an interesting character, and if people don't care about them, then they really don't care about all the rest of the stuff. Um, I know that when I was growing up, there were some really fabulous hard science authors, but they weren't necessarily very good storytellers. And so I could read, and I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to mention names, but uh, they would write a really technically great story in the science and it would just be wonderful. But when I read the story, I was disappointed in, the overall effect because the characters were just kind of being moved on a chessboard. So that's a really good point, Teresa. Um, so here's one. We're going to kind of reverse this and we're not going to say, what do you find easy to write? I'm going to ask you, what do you find hard to write about the other universes you write in? So if you find fantasy easier to write, what do you find harder about science fiction? Why do you feel that way? A lot of it, to me, comes down to familiarity. I spend so much time in the science fiction world that it's for me. Plus, I, I kind of, to some extent, am relaxed about it. Uh, there's a quote from Rob Sawyer that has helped me relax and, and live with my limitations there pretty well. He said, you don't have to be a pro athlete to be a sports reporter and you don't have to be a pro scientist to be a science fiction author. You have to love the subject enough to dig in and do the research you have to. But when it comes to fantasy, there is no research. I mean, yes, I can just ape what people have done before me, but that's not Mm -hmm. original fantasy. You can research certain aspects of it, but at the end of the day, you have to make up the whole thing. And, uh, I have to make up the whole thing up fall back on. Uh, that's fair. Would you say that also that in reading it for um, not just in you having trouble, you know, researching it and putting it in context and stuff, would you say that would then make it hard for the reader? Because most of us aren't necessarily living in a fantasy world. Some are, uh, but um, uh, would you say that that, that would then make it also hard to connect with the readers because they don't have an experience to rely on either. I think if it is, it's my fault going back to what Amy was saying and and what you're discussing in the last question of you have to introduce the topics through the events and experiences of the characters. If Mm -hmm. I am not doing that, then, then they won't get it. And I don't think it's their fault. I think it's I, I've let them down that I have not. In, in some sense, it's just like any other plot element that you want to foreshadow big events that are coming up. Well, you want to foreshadow the fantastic. You want to foreshadow the magic. You want to have made sure that when it happens, it's an aha moment, not a where did that come from moment. Right. Um, okay. That seems quite fair. Charity. How about you? Honestly, with um, writing science fiction specifically, Mm -hmm. it terrifies me a little bit that I am going to get a specific detail wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. I've also found that in the the handful of times that I've been told, okay, 
I want you to write this short story for this particular anthology. And I start reading through the canon for it and, you know, getting a, a feel for that particular world building. Um, I start to really, I second guess myself and I start to try to fit my stories into a specific niche that they should never fit in because it's not part of my style. Um, so creating something in science fiction, you feel like there are set parameters, set expectations on what you need to put out there and it overshadows what you're trying to create. You lose that, that love, that connection, that, that ability to create something that comes from your own writer's voice. Do you think it's a, um, do you think it's a desire on your part that you just don't want to do it? I like writing anything. So I'm okay. not quite sure I would say that. I will say that when I'm building in someone else's world, I think I feel more pressure because oh, yes. yeah, you don't want to mess with somebody else's world. You know, right. you don't want to go, oh, well, I'm going to add this in. No, that's not allowed. You can't put that in there. I, I know that quite well. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that part of the, uh, the stipulations, and I think for some people, especially people who are new writing to that particular genre, you start to feel a little bit of this weight. You know, I mean, you look at all of the people that came before you and right. you feel this oh. weight and this pressure to create something in a certain way that, you know, it's like like when Amy was saying earlier that she tries literary fiction and she's like, I'm just, that's not, you know, that, that's not always a successful thing. I feel that because it's, you feel like you're putting yourself into a different box and hoping that you fit. And it, it it's not always exactly right. Would it be fair to say that uh, if any of us stop for 10 seconds to think about all the people that have done this before us, no matter what we write, that we would look and say, what right do we have to possibly add to this genre after this person? You know, honestly, writers in general, and I, I think you'll all agree with me when I say this, we all have those moments where we're like, what the heck am I doing? How, who am I kidding right now? You know, this is, is this any good? Is this even worth putting out there? Because we get those voices in our head where we start to doubt what we're doing. We feel the pressure. We feel the weight. We look at, you know, our favorite author or authors and we go, I'm never going to be that. But you're right. You're never going to be that because you're not that person and you should never try to be that person. Um, um, but it doesn't change the pressure. No, it, it doesn't. And uh, I've quit writing four times in the last month. <laughs> So I, I get it. In yeah. the same day, right? <laughs> uh, no, actually, this was over a period of days when I would, you know, read something and just say, seriously, you know, these people are going to find you out eventually. Yeah. And Amy, I, can I add something? I wanted to speak to Charity. Oh, please point. do. Kind of, um, I grew up on Star Trek. I hate to say this, but I actually saw the original pilot the night it came out. So that wow. kind of dates me a little bit. Yeah, yeah, me too. Bill. Me too. Some of us can say that, Teresa. But anyway, um, I love the, you know, the, you know, go boldly go where no one has gone before. And I kind of apply that to my writing so that I, you know, you can't succeed if you don't try, even if it's mm -hmm. difficult and all that. And frankly, I know that they, you know, some people will say there's only so many plots, only so many characters. I consider that to be cow manure, I think was the nice term we used earlier, <laughs> that that is just not true. And with all the new and different things that are happening in our society now, if you take those new technological advancements and go out 50 years or 100 years or 150 years, if your imagination is kept carefully fertilized and watered, that you read lots of things and uh, watch a lot of movies, watch a lot of documentaries. You can you can come up with new ideas and new stories. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I I usually don't write in other people's worlds, but I was uh, asked a couple of years ago to write um, in a for an anthology that, that was telling the life stories of the other characters in Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Oh, this, sweet. this was, you know, oh my gosh, I'm going to write in Charles Dickens' world, who I don't know if you will all agree with me, but he is one of the greatest creators of character who has ever picked up a pen. His characters oh, are oh, memorable people. They become examples yeah. and all that. So what I I read 
I don't know how many, I've read A Christmas Carol probably a thousand times. I love that story. And I went ahead and did it. But I chose for my character the poulterer, the man who sells him the, the turkey, which was very uncommon, by the way, in England at that time, because turkeys mm -hmm. are American. But I picked a character that nobody had, you know, the very little was written by Dickens about him. All he did was sell him a turkey. I don't. I think there's almost no interaction with him at all. And I just went with the character and tried to imitate Dickens, but then I took it out of England and put it in India. So, so I can do that. But if I tried to write a Christmas Carol story that primarily took place in, um, in Victorian England, I would fail miserably. But I was able to do that because I just did something completely different. Of course, when I put it into India during the Raj, um, I would say I spent 200 hours doing research for that story. Yeah. It was a deep, dark rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, but I really <laughs> enjoyed doing it. And for me, it was worthwhile. I, and, so, and it was one of those things where you took canon, you took somebody else's wor world, but you turned it into your voice, which I think is really the best thing we can do with any genre. So. I, um, I've had the um, privilege of writing in several shared universes. And I just released an anthology of people writing one of my universes. And I have to tell you that it's so flattering to see other people creating stories in something you created. Uh, I feel that way. I'm not sure. I'm sure some people don't, but I do. And uh, it, it's just flattering to think that people would take their time to build on something that you created. Um, I, I don't know exactly how much time we have left, but I do have one final question that I think uh, uh, the listeners might be interested in is I'd like to know what one secret source you use for your research that maybe other people haven't thought of. Now, it can be common. It can be a common thing. And I'll say mine on the front end, okay? Mine is YouTube. Now, I know everybody's got YouTube and they're very familiar with it, but they might not be familiar with what you can actually drill down and find there. Because I was recently researching a story on how to actually make a bow out of common woods that you can find in America. And there's more than, there's a lot of different videos you can watch that will step by step show you how to do it. And uh, I have done thing, other things like I had someone starting up a jet airplane in the cockpit and although I don't normally do this, I wanted the whole sequence of what you do to go through it. Well, I was able to find a video that showed me, pause it, write it, pause it, write it, and all that. So I got it precisely correct. So, and if I ruined it for you, I'm sorry, uh, if that was going to be yours. Um, Martin, let's start with you. I'm going to go with one which is absolutely the simplistic one, but I would say I use this more in every book, in every story, than anything else combined. I okay. call it Facebook Research Assistant. All right. I just, I, I Facebook Research Assistant's uh, Fire and Rescue Department. And then I pose a question, and I'm going to get on any given question 30 answers, some authoritative, some completely clueless. Um, approximately 60% of the answers will be to a question I never asked, but <laughs> I will pretty reliably get two or three people who have got a clue that starts me down more, more research and gets me to a point where I've got my answer. Uh, Amy. Well, for fantasy, I long ago discovered the Phoenix and the Dragon bookstore in Atlanta, Georgia, which okay. is like a metaphysical bookstore that has different sections on this kind of magic, this kind of magic, this kind of magic. And I would go through and look at them and find a lot of current books on magic. But what I started using was medieval grimoires, mm. books of magic that were written in uh, basically in the Middle Ages. And then for my science fiction, my single favorite source of ideas for science fiction is reading doctoral dissertations online. They're available. People publish them online and they've got new science in them and they're fantastic. 
And if it's in an area that I can understand, if I can understand and read the dissertation, uh, fabulous idea. So every once in a while, I'll just browse through and read a bunch of dissertations. That is absolutely a great tip for anybody who's writing or anybody who's looking for a um, something to write about. Now, is there a particular site where you find these? Uh, generally, if you just look up doctoral dissertation and like the area that you're in interested okay. in, um, I recently, uh, I'm still eligible for Writers of the Future, and I recently got a silver honorable mention on something that I did, aqua gardening, which was a combination of fish and plants and also recycling. And I just put either recycling or recomposition or aqua, you know, aquaculture and Usually you'll pop up several and then one really good site is JSTOR for oh, yeah, dissertations and papers. But if you're not a member, you have to get, you ha you can pay for a membership. Um, I usually get them through um, a dear, dear friend of mine who, to whom I absolutely love and to whom I'm related. She gets them for me off where she works. So, yeah. um, but Jay that's the best wonderful. source, but it's not the only source. A lot of universities publish their dissertations and their master's theses. They're, they're interesting as well. But don't discount the medieval grimoire. Some of those are pretty fabulous. Oh, I, I'm sure, yeah. And, and to modern readers, they would be completely unknown. Uh, Charity? Um, I was going to say for JSTOR, check your local library because a lot of times they have memberships to JSTOR and you can use them to access those, you know, and, the articles and documents. And the other thing I was going to say is um, there's, I was, I had the opportunity to actually uh, buy a membership to JSTOR uh, last year for a ridiculously cheap price. So sometimes you were able to do that. And for people who don't know what JSTOR is, JSTOR is kind of a um, database of <laughs> virtually everything that's ever been written in any sort of magazine or uh, academic magazine or journal or things like that. There's some highly unusual things in there. And uh, it, it's it's almost hard to describe, but it, it's a it's a wonderful source. Um, but Charity, uh, tell us your, your source. Um, generally teachers. It's kind of, you know, I mean, that that's where I lean because uh, when I was doing some things with uh, alternate history, I started asking about plausibility. Mm -hmm. um, when I was looking at, you know, some of the science fiction, when I was looking at uh, chemical compositions and how things run together, I, I asked. Um, you can do, you can look up one of the university websites and reach out to a professor of whichever group you're looking for. Even your local teachers, they might not have degrees specifically in, you know, what you absolutely need, but they might be able to direct you to someone who can answer that question. Um, but most of the time they answer back if you reach out to a, a college oh, they professor do. too. They you do. Know, they they want to talk about what they're good at. You know? they do. Like, hey, I'm writing a novel. Okay, I'm in. What do you need? How can I help <laughs> you? So. Uh, to play on that, um, actually uh the university of memphis i live east of memphis has a uh, uh very very well known uh earthquake uh research area and and i reached out to them for an earthquake uh that happened in my first novel and boy i tell you what it, i could almost not get the, the the professor you know i i have enough now please you know he was, <laughs> he was so helpful and the other thing i was going to mention is uh to playing on that also don't forget your local museums. Yep. And for me, one of the things I've used uh, a lot is the zoo. Because if you need to know anything about, say, snakes or uh, animals, you can call whoever's over there, one of the keepers. They'll, and trust me, they would love to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about whatever their specialty is. Yep. And uh, it's a great source. Okay, and Teresa, what about you? What What is your secret source? Uh, so you find conventions of, of both types to be very useful just to listen to what other people are talking about to get inspirations and things like that, story ideas. Yeah. I'm sure as most of us here would agree when somebody comes up to you after a panel and says, could I learn more? It's not very hard to twist our arm and get us to to talk more about it. 
Uh, I am going to throw out one more thing that I use quite a bit. Um, and, and this is for more contemporary fiction and things. But uh, I use uh, Google Earth a, a lot. And one of the things that a lot of people don't do, some do, but is Street View. And if and as long as there's a road in the area and that's been photographed and you can put yourself in that location and you go to Street View, you can just turn around and describe what it is you're looking at. And even if it's going to be an alien world, but there's a place here on Earth that's fairly close to it, you can do exactly the same thing in a fantasy setting. Find a road and just with a waterfall in one area, maybe, and some trees over here, and just describe it. Because, sure, you're, you're actually stealing from real geography, but nobody's ever going to know it. Um, I do want to thank everybody, and I think we're, we're, I think we're over an hour, so we're probably beyond where they would have liked us to have been. Um, we had a few technical issues that I think may have limited it, and it's not as give and take as a regular panel, but you guys were great. I, I learned a lot, and um, that's not hard for me, but for other people, I'm sure they did too. Anything, so let's have one final word from everybody, Amy. Oh, I was just going to tell, I was going to just thank you. I really enjoyed the panel, learned a lot. And, um, I wanted to mention one thing, um, years ago, I read a book, um, by Chris Robertson. I think it was the, um, it was the dragon's nine sons. And it is one of the best examples of adding a salient detail that you couldn't have expected. If you haven't read it, it came out in 2008. It's one of the best space operas I've ever read. And it has a bizarre detail that just grabs you and shakes you. So read Chris right. Robertson's Dragon's Nine Sons. Thank you. Excellent. Teresa, any final words? But if you don't write, that first draft, like you said to begin with, if you don't write that first draft. Uh, Can't have a second draft without a first. <laughs> Charity. Um, well, if we're giving advice to young writers, I would say the same thing that I say to all my classes. The hardest part about writing is just starting. You just go. Um, um, find your passion and go. So. If if I may use a quote from David Weber, um, he said, little children don't stop trying to walk the first time they fall down. Yeah. You know, yeah. the only way they can ever learn to walk is by walking. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And so whether it's science fiction or fantasy, you know, whichever one is your passion, whichever one draws you, or if it's a mix, which some of mine have ended up becoming, <laughs> then that's what you do. You know, you okay. put it down and you just keep going until, you know, you're done with it. So great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Martin. I stick with the theme then. Uh, I'm going to quote Kipling. There are 960 ways of constructing tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. I think a big thing that stops a lot of young writers and a lot of older writers who still are just holding themselves back is this fear, I'm doing this wrong. And there are ways to be wrong, absolutely. But there's an awful lot of ways to be right. And one of the first, again, get something out there. If you're waiting for it to be perfect, you are going to write. Excellent advice. I can I could not agree more. Um, okay, I thank you all, and uh, thank you for putting up with me. That's not something some. It's not something everybody does. So I appreciate it from you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all take care. Thank you. Enjoy it very much.